Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Count Christo and this is my Mayo and Taxes tutorial series. In this episode, I'm going to talk through, fairly quickly, won't be a very long episode, everything you need to do before you unpause your game. This will cover various of the new mechanics that you may or may not be familiar with and I'll do short explanations of them. Some of them will merit their own videos in the future where I'll go really more in depth about how they work, but for now, I want you to be able to unpause the game after you finish watching this video. I'm going to recommend you begin playing as Milan. Now Milan begins in a war with Montferrat, Mantua and Ferrara, but you, if you watched the first episode and did what you're told, are an experienced EU4 player, so you should be able to win that war no problem. You may have to take out some loans, but that should be fine. One tip, if you are going to play as Milan, you have estates in your nation. Burgers, greater nobles, lesser nobles, you can also have tribals. Those, I believe, are the only four estates. You may think that the state is an estate, but that is actually just a thing you can interact with that I will teach you about in a second. This is you, essentially. If you're struggling with your war, and even if you're not, it's generally sensible, you can get men from the greater nobles. If you go here, there will be a button when you're at war called defensive war support. I believe it's a defensive war. If it's an offensive war, it'll say offensive war support. And you can choose to get some men from your nobles. And those should help you win that war. Once you've won that war, you have a core here, which I'm assuming you've managed to retake. And here we are in the current situation. Just so you know, this... Uh, tutorial is not really going to focus on just taking you all the way through a Milan campaign, just for this one so you can really get started. I thought I'd talk you very quickly through the very start. So there you are. You're solidified here. In this case, I vassalized Mantua and Montferrat. Uh, and you now have, if you don't already realize, control, pretty indisputed control, over one of the richest areas in the entire game. In vanilla U4, Milan and Italy is highly developed, but not nearly as highly developed as it is in Mayo and Taxes. Okay, so what do you need to do before you unpause? First off, I hope it goes without saying, but you need to do essentially everything you would do in vanilla. That means advisors, that means picking allies, that means looking into improving relations and building spy networks, and all of those good things are fairly similar than they are in the base game. Quick word on alliances. People can only have a certain number of alliances, which is controlled by their international rank. Their international rank is kind of like your government rank in vanilla, you know, duchy, kingdom, empire. Except there are, I believe, five ranks. Let's take a look. Yeah, five ranks. Minor, average, major, significant, and hegemonic. And they're controlled by the number... I think it's controlled by your development, not your population size, despite what it says in that tooltip. I believe that's incorrect, but I'm not certain. That's a little minor thing about Mayo and Taxes. Some tooltips may be wrong. Some things may be under construction. That's one of the things you live with with a big overhaul mod. On the whole, it works beautifully. But just sometimes you're going to need to live with things like that. And if you don't know uh, what something means because it's not very clear or whatever, go and ask. There are forums. There's a EU4 Facebook group where there's loads of knowledgeable people, myself included, who uh, know about this mod and can help you out if you don't understand something. So... We're trying to unpause, so let's work towards that goal. You're going to want to do your normal things, set up some uh, advisors. You will notice that the advisors modifiers are all different from vanilla. Some of them are nerfed, some of them are buffed, some of them are just different. Uh, that's all similar to vanilla, so I'm just going to leave that and assume you you know the deal when it comes to, to advisors. On to the government screen. Nothing really you're going to need to do here, except you're going to want to note that centralization which is very similar to the base game's absolutism mechanic, it is different, but it's, it's quite similar, is enabled from the very beginning of the game. You don't need to wait till a certain age until it unlocks. And while we're on the subject, there are no ages currently in Mayo and Taxes. I personally am working to try and add those back in at the moment, but I'm very busy, so it may take me a while. <laughs> you have a certain amount of maximum centralization, very similar to the base game, and it will be modified by all kinds of different things, very similar to the base game. Raising it, however, is much more difficult than it might be in the base game. So as you can see at the bottom of this list, those are all the things it does, which I trust that you can read and therefore work out whether you want more or less of it. You know, spoiler alert, usually you want more. Uh, but you are a competent EU4 player, so I'm sure you can read tooltips. That's basically the, the one criteria required to become a competent EU4 player. But at the bottom, these are the things it's currently changing by. Centralized estate, plus 0.4. Memory of the HRE, minus 0.1. Stability, plus 0.5. Corruption, minus 0.03. Now, centralized estate is a policy. So let's jump over to the decisions window. This is a policy 
which increases your centralization. This is the primary way in which you will increase your centralization. The two main ways it increases, well, I suppose three, having positive stability, using this decision, and forming countries tends to give you 10. So that is the main way you're going to want to do it. Early on in the game, when you're especially playing as Milan, you're going to want to crank your centralization as high as you can get it. Because it does give you some unrest, but it gives you loads of other really nice modifiers. The tech cost is brilliant, the trade power is good, the yearly inflation reduction is very good. So, that's centralization. This is a number you're going to want to keep an eye on. If you start to get to be a really big country, you might want to start dropping your centralization because it does cause a lot of unrest. Okay, moving on. Diplomacy. Like I said, very similar to the base game. You don't need to worry about uh, many changes here apart from that alliance limit. You should also note that your diplomatic relations limit tend to be much higher in Mayo and Taxes. So vassal swarms, even when you're not the HRE, are a lot more viable. Now the economy screen itself, it's very similar to the base game. The things that feed into it, of course, are really quite different. For example, public services and toll loss. What the hell is that? Don't worry, dear viewer. It's when we get to this tab and I will explain it all. Don't worry if your inflation trends up at the beginning. Your inflation will trend up at the beginning. There are various modifiers you have on your country as a base. And one of them is that your inflation will increase by a certain amount each year. Now, inflation is now something, and various other modifiers in vanilla, and, in vanilla, in mayo and taxes, are very similar to prestige. As you know, as you should know, because you're supposed to be a competent vanilla player, prestige trends towards a certain number. So let's say you have a modifier that gives you plus five prestige per year. That will mean you slowly trend towards having 50 prestige per year. It's very similar with inflation. At the beginning of the game with no other modifiers, I believe your inflation trends towards about 10%. So if you see yourself with 10% inflation in vanilla, oh, it's a disaster. Don't worry about it. Essentially, very similar to vanilla. Balance the books. Don't, don't pay maintenance when you're not at war unless you're about to be attacked. Don't have too many forts active. All that good stuff, and you'll be fine. We will talk in much more detail about how to have a flourishing economy, how to manage trade, but all of that comes in future. Trade, in general, on a superficial level, is very similar to the base game. Transfer to your capital node when you can, in this case, for just to defend myself for collecting in the Adriatic. I can't transfer. This trade range is much shorter in Mayo and Taxes. And uh, there you go. That is uh, that's trade and income. So there's trade. Obviously, don't need to worry about this too much. One thing to mention, mercantilism does nothing in Mayo and Taxes. You will always have 0% and it will always do nothing. So don't worry about mercantilism. Technology. Now, institutions in Mayo and Taxes are different, and there's something you need to worry about a little bit less in the short term, but a lot more in the long term. We'll talk, we'll have a special video, which will be only on institutions. But for now, suffice to say, you're playing in Italy, you're going to be okay. <laughs> Most of the institutions spawn in or around Italy in the early part of the game, so you really don't need to worry about them too much. Tech, it's very similar to the base game. It gives all kinds of modifiers, and you can, uh, I'm sure you can, you can read those and see what's going to be important. Keep up to date on mill tech, you know, get your admin tech high enough that you can get some, uh, this is essentially administrative efficiency from the base game, and diplo tech can go hang unless you have too many vessels. <laughs> very similar to the base game. You will notice when you load up your game of Mayo and Taxes that whoever you play, you began with an idea group already unlocked. I believe that's true. I haven't checked all 10 million countries in the mod, but so far, that's what I've experienced. You will begin with an idea group unlocked. That means before you unpause, you have a decision to make. Do I want to fill out this idea group? It will begin with four ideas unlocked. That's uh, 1,200 points-ish, assuming you're paying base cost for each idea. So that's a big amount to kill if you want to abandon the idea group. You do get 150 back, but come on. Or rather, you'd get 140 back, because I filled out another one. Or, sorry, you get 120 back. But you might want to abandon it. If you, for example, started with an idea group you really don't like, say mercenary ideas, which you might not like, or espionage ideas. These idea groups are different, by the way. I'll do a special video talking through some of the changes in the idea groups, but for now, you're a competent player, you can read what modifiers are. Go ahead and have a look through all of the different idea groups. You may want to abandon your idea group, but you probably won't. And it's worth noting that because you're already committed to an idea group, that may affect where you want to focus your uh, government in terms of generating points in the very early game. 
Next up, missions. Mayon Taxes contains a huge set of mission trees, especially this very, very pretty one and large one for Milan. If you're playing as Milan, you will benefit from the glory of this massive tree, which has various different sections. You can see it's all split into different areas. This region here, all this down here and all this, is the HRE tree, which every HRE member who is a monarchy has. This here is the default uh, kind of base tree, then there's a military tree, a religion tree, all that kind of thing. You can look through here and see the wonderful things, but make sure you have in your mind which missions you want to fulfill and the kind of bonuses you're going to get from them. That's always useful. Decisions. We covered centralize the state, but there's a lot more going on in the decisions menu. Now, of course, Mayon Taxes being a huge overhaul has had to kind of jury rig in a few systems to make them work within the game. One of those is, or many of those rather, are are controlled through the decisions window. So we're going to look at some of these. First off, policies. Stability is very different in Mayo and Taxes than the base game. It's a, something you generate over time. If you lose two stability, you're going to be mad, real mad, because that doesn't mean you just lost 350 admin points or whatever it would be to boost from one to back to three. It means that you're going to have to wait decades before you can get that back probably decades if you lost two stability. That is a huge big deal and it really changes the way the game plays. Lots of features like inflation, like... Um, can you still buy down inflation? I think you... You can still buy down inflation, but many things you can't just instantly buy down, like war exhaustion, and you can't just pay to increase your stability either. So, you may want to enact some policies which increase your stability. These ones... Uh, costs one point each in any category and give you 5%, sorry, 15%, then 10%, then 5%, what's called stability increase interval. The stability increase interval is the amount of points you generate towards earning more stability. We'll worry about that more in just a second. As I've said, ad nauseum, you're a competent player, look at all your decisions. Many of them have very nice, very explanatory tooltips, which explain precisely what they mean and how they help. One that I would like to touch on now is the special map mode one. This opens up an event chain which allows you to show data on the trade map mode or in the province window. So let's say you wanted to know, and you probably won't before you're on pause, but just for the sake of argument, where are the best farmers? Farming relating data, farming efficiency, show farming efficiency in provinces and the trade map. And then you just close it. So there we go. Now the trade map will lag like hell because we just add, um, added a modifier to every province in the game. As it turns out, the very best farmers, it looks like, are in Sicily, in Granada. And I think if we take a look over at China, of course we can't see China. Never mind. There's some very good farmers down here near, uh, near Constantinople as well. But there we go. When you want to turn that off, you can go here. You can go select special map mode and you can go remove modifiers from trade map. There you go. Now they've gone. Brilliant. There are loads of different modifiers you can add in there, and I fully encourage you to explore that and find out all of different wonderful things you can show yourself, different information you can give yourself. Now, something you don't need to worry too much about as Milan, but a mechanic you should be aware of, is communication efficiency. Communication efficiency is a huge change in Mayo and Taxes, and will heavily influence how you build your empires. Essentially, if it takes 10 days for someone to get from your capital, in this case a messenger or runner, as they're referred to internally in the game, uh, from Lombardia to Rex, for example. How long does it take just for... So it takes eight days. It takes eight days for someone to get from Lombardia to Rex here. That has a certain impact on Rex. The higher the communication time, the more unrest it causes and the more autonomy it causes. This is going to mean that when you build a big empire, you're going to need to build a huge network of roads and ports and local administration centers to lower that communication time so that you can have low autonomy and low unrest in your vast, say, Mediterranean empire. You might need to build a network of, um, of ports and harbors down from Napoli to Messina down to Alexandria to allow you to communicate quickly with Alexandria. Otherwise, the nobles in Alexandria will just start doing their own thing, revolting and really paying you a very small amount of the taxes they should. 
But like I said, you don't need to worry about it too much, and there will be a video focusing exclusively on communication efficiency and how to manage it. So back to our tabs. Next up, stability and expansion. Largely the same as vanilla, but a few things, as we've touched on a bit, have changed. Stability is not something you can arbitrarily change. The modifiers of stability are also different. Raw exhaustion is not something you can arbitrarily change, and the modifiers of it are a bit different. Largely the same. Also, check your disasters because they are not the same as vanilla, and you might get one firing when you least expect it. Overextension is different from vanilla, as is most things. We don't currently have any provinces causing overextension, so let's just change that. Uh, annex Montferrat, please, console. So here we go. Now we have some overextension. 4.7% overextension means we lose each year 10.5 ducats, and our maximum manpower is decreased by five. Sorry, by 4,500. Those are some pretty harsh modifiers for the early game. But note what it does not give you. Anything else. It doesn't hurt your trade power. It doesn't hurt your... Um, is it production? Does it hurt production efficiency? I can't remember. Anyway, the most important one. It doesn't hurt your unrest. This area is uncored. It is not fully integrated into our administration. That actually helps the unrest, if we look at this here. The fact that it is non-core gives you minus 12 unrest in provinces. So if you have an area you can't really control, say it's got very low communication efficiency, say you just captured Morocco and you're sitting up here in Milan, and you haven't got any good ports down here so the communication efficiency is really bad, you might want to just leave this military administration, which is what the costs of overextension represent, holding Morocco for you. So, overextension. It's seriously changed. There's also no problem with going over 100% anymore, except the modifiers just keep getting higher and higher and higher. But not exponentially, and there's no triggered events that happen when you're over 100% overextension. Next up, religion. Reli Next up, let's take a look at religion and the decisions you need to make before you unpause. Now, there are two new modifiers for Mayo and Taxes. Church influence and piety. Some nations have piety in vanilla, but in Mayo and Taxes, every single country has these two modifiers. They seem a bit overwhelming, especially when you take a look at this tooltip. <laughs> there are lots of tooltips. Read them, they are wonderful. Okay. So, church influence and country piety. The reason this is a decision you a decision you need to make is that there will be good reasons to have high and low church influence and piety. Church influence, you usually don't want to have zero or a hundred. Sometimes you might, quite, you know, there are definitely circumstances I can think of, but generally you want to have a certain amount. So weigh up the modifiers it gives you and decide which you would like. You could see the modifiers it would give you at maximum church influence and the ones it will give you at minimum, which is none, and decide how far along this scale do I want to go. Before you decide it's a terrible idea to have any church influence, let me tell you something very important. You have an education system in your country which requires funding. The church spends almost all the money it gains by costing you 40% local production efficiency and 20% local tax modifier. Almost all of that money goes directly into your education system. So having a church essentially doesn't cost you very much at all because you'd be paying for the education system if they weren't. If you want to have a trash education system, and you don't, but if you wanted to have a trash education system, then you could have no church influence and not pay them, and then you're saving money. But generally, having at least some church influence doesn't really hurt at all. Piety, on the other hand, unlike church influence, wants to be very high or very low. You are either fanatic or secular. Fanaticism gives these things. You get some stability, you get some morale of armies, all that good stuff. You do tolerate heretics less well. Worth noting on the topic of religion, the more you tolerate someone, the harder it is to convert them. Minus one tolerance of heretics is actually plus one missionary strength against them. That's very powerful, so it's worth noting that those modifiers could actually be seen as pure positives. Secularism gives trade efficiency, advisor costs, tech costs, and more tolerance. Now, generally I find that fanaticism is a lot stronger, but of course this is just to taste. 
So, what affects church influence and country piety? Let's go back to the decisions menu, because now there is a very convenient way to find out. We have 5% piety. Why, you ask? Why? Because of these reasons. So, fire the decision, you know, your adjective, piety, and it will show you all the things that can affect your piety and what the current effect from that modifier is. As you can see, most of them aren't giving much. As you can see, church influence plays into piety because we have X church influence <laughs> and the game crashed. Now, this is something I will leave in because it's worth noting that while Mayo and Taxes is absolutely wonderful, it does occasionally crash. This is something I'm afraid you may have to come to live with. I'll see you in a second. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Sorry about that. A little bit of a crash. So we were looking at piety. Here are the piety modifiers. You can read. Read them. They're fairly self-explanatory. Then you have imp church influence. One of the big ones for this is church property. So you need to uh, pay close attention to how much land your church has. There will be regular events which can give them land, and you can use this option to give them more church influence. Higher church influence, higher fanaticism, and of course, high, sorry, higher church property, higher fanaticism, and of course, higher influence itself. You can also appropriate church property, but only in certain conditions. You are supposed to be competent, which means you should be able to read this uh, tooltip and understand that you have to have uh, a, not a Regency Council, one of the two things listed under the tick, and then one of the things before the indent. And if there's an indent, then it needs to be everything after the indent. We're not here for a basic vanilla tutorial, so you should be able to read that and know when you can do that. This will let you take 10 or 5 uh, units of church property, 10 or 5 units out of a potential maximum of 60, so it's not actually 10%. But there you go. If you don't do this on a fairly regular basis or get the right events, which you're very unlikely to get, you will trend towards having more church influence, so it's worth bearing in mind. Another thing about religion, it's very, very difficult to convert anyone in Mayo and Taxes if you don't have any religious ideas. So if you're wanting to go and note, there are many religious ideas. I think there's five idea groups that are religious ideas in all. Uh, possibly six, one of which is only available if you're an Eastern religion. Not certain, though. So if you're planning on taking land that's not the true faith, be sure to be ready to convert it with idea groups. There is also passive conversion over time. We'll touch on that in a special religion video. The military is very much as it is in vanilla, um, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. There are more modifiers for almost everything, and you'll just need to bear those in mind, essentially, is the main difference. Uh, also on the military, while we're there, to siege a level 1 fort, you're going to need two men. To siege a level 2 fort, you're going to need four men, obviously, by men. I'm talking in thousands. Uh, also worth noting, while we're touching on military, many, many provinces will have forts that do not exert a zone of control, which are these local fortifications. We'll talk more about the estates and buildings later, but suffice to say, the estates build these in places they feel are not defended well enough, and uh, they'll be, a lot of your time will be sent sieging those down. Subjects are very much the same in Mayo and Taxes, except that there are a few things you cannot do with subjects. First off, you can't integrate them straight away, and secondly, you uh, can't ch switch their religion by decision. And the thing about annexing them is they have what's called a integration time. Choose a policy regarding our junior partners. There's a very similar one for vassals if you have any vassals. Opens up this ev event. This shows you the various things which speed up or slow down your integration. So to assimilate this tiny little place is going to take 37.4 more years because of various modifiers. If we look at master specifically, we can see the things that affect the speed at which we do it. You can also manually increase the progress by negotiating a tighter bond, which you can do, I think, through, uh, through an interaction with them, but also through a decision in here. You go here with them, and you can negotiate a tighter bond. They might say no, though, so it's worth bearing in mind. That's subjects. Finally, estates, but we're going to need to spawn them. So let's just show you the startup events, because it's useful to be prepared for these. Startup initialization incoming, trust me, it'll be fine. There's some heavy lag in the very early game of Mayo and Taxes because of the uh, all the setup the mod has to do. Let's touch on these three. In Italy, there's something called the Italian Balance. It's very simple, actually, although it looks quite complicated if you were to try and read all this flavor text. Uh, the larger you are, the more aggressive expansion you'll cause until you form Italy. 
that's it. You can choose how many pop-ups you get about religious stuff. I like pop-ups, so I'll say all news. Whenever you go into a war, you have to pick a looting policy. More looting, more damage to provinces. We'll go into looting when we're talking about province wealth and province buildings and all that kind of thing. Uh, but you also get more morale of armies, but less discipline. Loot is money that you will be able to get at the end of the war. Some goes to you, and some goes to your province wealth. Both of which are great for you, though, because your province wealth is something you can tax, and it's a resource that you have uh, not exactly accessible to you all the time, but that's, it's good to have. Heavily restricting looting gives you, obviously, less looting damage is done, and you also have more discipline. But, have we got our estates yet? No, we haven't. Give me a second. So, for some reason, the estates aren't spawning in that Milan game. I guess I mucked something up, but I know who has some estates. The Roman Empire. So let's take a look at the estates over here. As you can see, my estates are hugely loyal, and that's because estates have dynamic loyalty. So many things in this mod are highly dynamic, and it's beautiful. It doesn't trend down, it doesn't trend up. What happens is they get more or less loyal depending on how rich they are. So I've just conquered a vast quantity of land in a very short time, which means all my estates have got fantastically rich, because obviously they just own more provinces than they did before. Something to note about estates. Every province in your entire empire, or country, or duchy ever, will be owned by an estate. This is not optional. The amount of autonomy in the province represents how much of that province they own. So, for example, the Burgers own Constantinople, Byzantium, as it is called. In uh, now, since we're the Romans, we I think we renamed it. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, they own it, but they actually don't make any money from it because it has autonomy. Your estates earn money from all the autonomy land. They, all the autonomy in all the land they hold. So having autonomy is not strictly bad because your estates spend their money productively. They can build buildings, they can raise troops for you to use, all kinds of good things. Reasons why you want your estates to have money. Obviously you'd rather you had the money so you could control it directly. But don't think of it as a loss. When a province has 100% autonomy, you haven't, if you conquer a province for example, let's say it has 100% autonomy, you haven't just conquered nothing like you have in the base game. In Mayo and Taxes, or almost nothing, because you still get some trade power anyway. <laughs> in Mayo and Taxes, your estate just got richer, and that's good for the whole country. Because they may, might make money over here in France, highly autonomous France, and then come and spend it upgrading the capital because the estates are generous sometimes. Ways you should interact with your estates. They have something called privileges. If you go to assess your estate's power, get used to going into events to see things, by the way. Uh, you can see, if you click this, these are the privileges the burgers currently have. You can see they have various modifiers, most of them bad. Your estates constantly want to have more privileges, and almost always you constantly want them to have less privileges. This is an ongoing battle between court and country, although in this case some of the countries are cities, the sum of country is city dweller, but the nobles and the burghers and the court are constantly fighting for influence. You're getting more, they're getting more, and obviously, hopefully, you can keep the trend in your favour. During bad times, you can slacken your grip and let them have more influence in exchange for increased stability and things like that, but generally you want to be trending towards centralization and increasing the power of the state. Now, uh, how does that work? Once every 10 years or so, your estates, I'm going to go a huge detailed video later on, but just for now, once every 10 years-ish, and there are many, many factors that feed into it, which I will go into in another video, they will demand a privilege. And if they don't have, feel they have enough privileges, or they're not very loyal, or they're quite influential, or some confluence of those three, then if you say no to giving them another privilege, they will make you lose stability, or probably lose stability. And they will be very upset, and they will ruin your country. <laughs> so that's quite risky. You'll also get something like 20 unrest in 75% of their provinces, or 50% of their provinces, and it changes depending on loads of different factors. You can also manually revoke their privileges. It's funny that it says revoke privileges peacefully. There is no way that I know of to revoke them non-peacefully. So when you revoke a privilege, so greater nobles, you may no longer have a significant relaxation of levy obligations. Uh, then you will get an event a few days later, and I'll just click through these and keep talking until it, uh, it pops up, about how upset they are. Now this event, I, but I think it's random. I'm not sure, and I'll go into it in a future video, but I think it's just random how upset they are. Um, and you can lose between 0 and 3 stability. And 3 stability losses, it's just crippling. But anyway, that is how... Um, I think the game might be about to crash again. 
<laughs> Hopefully not. Okay, all kinds of pop-ups. Oh, good lord. So, for example, I think it is random, because they're furious, right? Despite being 100% loyal. And there you go. Minus four stability. You can't have more than that. Minus three stability. Good lord. And that, essentially, would probably end my empire. <laughs> it might not, actually. It looks... How are we not getting loads of unrests? Loads of unrest after getting negative three stability. That's ridiculous. Anyway, in a less stable empire, that would mean the end. We're also just about to go bankrupt because we're losing a thousand ducats. What have I done in this campaign? I don't know what's going on. Anyway, <laughs> I loaded a game from a previous uh, a patch to show you this. So, Anyway, that's estates. There are loads of other ways you can interact with them. You can offer them favors, which gives you loyalty. But if you offer them noble house or low-level cabinet seats, you can cause, you know, six corruption. It's a big deal. And the gift is, you know, extraordinarily expensive. The burgers, however, can give you a very large amount of money. I can't re request it right now, because I requested it too recently. But you can give favours, you can demand support, the nobles can give you manpower, the burgers can give you money, all of them can give you decreased national unrest. There's lots of things to look, look into, so I highly recommend you have a good look at the estates and how they work. Now, on to the most important one on this tab, in my opinion, anyway. The state. Now, this is how you do various things and control various things about your country. And this is, by the way, the final thing before I'm going to let you unpause. <laughs> so don't worry, we're nearly there. One thing is stability. Here is an assessment of our current stability situation. We have X stability points. We need 100 stability points to go up a level. It's 100 between minus 3 and plus 1. Then it's 150. Then it's 200. No, sorry. It's 150 to go to 1. No, it's 100 to go to 1, 200 to go to 2, 300 to go to 3. I think that's right. Um, here's how many we're gaining per year, 0.86. That is our, that's 10 times our, mod, uh, our current stability multiplier, which obviously will be affected by very many uh, different things. If we come and look in here, do, 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 do. where is my stability cost modifier? Am I blind? There it is. Stability increase interval. Loads of different things influence it, and it comes out at plus 13%, which means we get points plus 13.8% slower, giving us point, uh, giving us 9.62 points per year. Uh, you can see it's a bit broken because it thinks we have no people in our country. <laughs> the other thing you can see in that window, actually, is your current discretionary expenses, how much you're spending monthly on university maintenance, on trade income and tolls to the estates, on building capital maintenance, all of these things we will go into more later, and road maintenance. There are certain buildings which have maintenance in my own taxes. You can also see your development level, which is based on the amount of buildings on average, or the, rather the value of the buildings on average in all your provinces. It goes from level 1 to level 9, I think. Uh, level 9 construction is a lot more expensive, but you also get crazy good bonuses for everything, basically. There's also a court level, an education level, an art and culture level, and urban production bonuses. Let's look at court um, and education here. So, the court... The court level is at 600%, so it's broken, but don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, your court level will be a certain amount out of 100%, and it will have changed a certain amount last year. The more money you give to the court, the uh, m more, uh, the higher court level you will attain. Higher court levels give different bonuses, from shabby, respective, impressive, luxurious, and the magnificent. Respective and shabby give debuffs. Impressive gives a couple of very small bonuses, and luxurious and magnificent give some really quite good bonuses. You need to give a certain amount of funding, uh, I believe it's per upper class population in all your empire and your subject empires, or countries. Um, it's something like that. But really you don't need to worry about why it's calculated too much. Just know that if you expand and get richer, you'll need to put more money into the court. If you're small, centralized and rich, your court will be less expensive than if you're big, sprawling and undeveloped. So put a certain amount in per year. Uh, so let's say we want to put 50 ducats in per year, which means this number here. Uh, sorry, there's a bit more info on that. You have a certain amount of wealth your court currently has, okay? Let's say it's a thousand. Each year, the court spends 10% of its cash. So in this case, about a hundred. If we give them a yearly funding of about a hundred, it'll stay roughly at a thousand. You actually need to put in slightly more than that because of maths, but... <laughs> Uh, that I did once understand, but it's since slipped my understanding. But there you go. So that's going to stay at roughly 1,000. And if 1,000 was enough to keep us at the court level we wanted, let's say we want court level 4, 
then that would maintain it. There is a mod that does this for you, which I will talk about in a future episode. Education is extremely similar, but with a little bit of a uh, added twist. Firstly, the church puts money in each year, into, they actually do it each month, into your education. I believe it's each month. Based on how wealthy they are, based on their church influence, which is why in some games, in fact most games these days, I feel like I want to have 100% church influence all the time, because they seem to put about 95% of the money they take off you into your education system. Other thing that makes it more complicated, education, I'm talking rather quickly, I'm sorry. Education is influenced by your universities. You have an education multiplier, multiplier in this case 1.1. It'll usually be a lot better than that. Uh, and that is based on the number of universities you have as relation to how many tens of thousands of urban, sorry, of upper class population you have. Upper class represent approximately 10% of the population of a province. And if you get 10,000 upper class population, they take up one university slot. A local university gives three, a world famous university gives five, you can get them from uh, art centres, give education slots as well. And the more of your students are educated, the more of your upper class pops have university places, the better your education multiplier. Your education multiplier essentially just makes your money in your education um, worth more. So let's say you had 32,000 and you had a 2 multiplier, that means you've got what was it, 22.4 thousand? Then you've got approximately 5 thousand. So you want to get your education multiplier high if you can, because it makes education cheaper. There is, of course, upkeep on your universities, so keep that in mind. Okay, that was rather long, but I think I've covered the very, very basics. So you can now unpause, I think. Accrue manpower, gain wealth, conquer new lands, forge alliances, negotiate vassalage of people, pick your idea groups, head forth into the world of mayo and taxes and have a wonderful time. I'm going to do a video tomorrow focusing more on estates and explaining that conflict between estates and court that is one of the really core systems of mayo and taxes. So if you want to watch that, it will be up on the channel probably tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, depending on when I put this up and when I manage to record that and all that good stuff. But until then, thank you ever so very, very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. Questions, things I got wrong, uh, random queries, any anything you want, put it in the description. I will see it. I will respond. Anyway.